morning. Let me also begin with this thank yous to the organizers of this big, uh, huge conference. That's a challenge, so thank you for the effort and for taking this challenge. And thank you for, to the organizers of this session, also for accepting us to, to present this paper here. So as, as you see, what I present here is a, is a joint paper. Unfortunately, my colleague was not able to come here today. But uh, I wanted to also to, to be here to present this as part of a project funded by the Ministry of Economy, Competitiveness, and Industry of the, uh, of the Spanish government. That is this, El Origen de la Orientalistica Antigua in España. Uh, it's a project uh, we are both of us working on, uh, launched just this January this year. So what you're going to see here are first steps of this project and also an ongoing research. We are carrying on, on um, the history of ancient Near Eastern studies in Spain end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Let me then begin with the, with the presentation. As you know, in the second half of the 19th century, networking among scholars from several countries influenced and shaped the way some archaeological collections and museums were then newly created and also managed. In this communication, we aim to show that the Spanish Academia, of course, was no exception to this trend, and we will do it through the st case studies, exactly two case studies, which have as common link the figure of the historian Juan Facundo Riaño. So first, we are going to begin with some words to, to present who was Juan Facundo Riaño. Riaño was art historian, Arabist, and he was at the time in Spain the main promoter of art history as a specific subject, differentiated from philology, literature, or archaeology. Riaño, like most Spanish historians of the time, since the youth, was showing a clear international vocation. So he was undertaking stays, among others, in London and Rome, something that was not that frequent at that time. He carried out also an intense academic career. He was professor of fine arts in the School of Diplomatic, director of the Museum of Artistic Reproductions, and he also um, had an intense political career. He was of progressive political conception and occupied several positions like the ones you can see uh, here in the slide. Moving now to the first case study. This first case study has to do with the uh, Museo de Reproducciones Artísticas. In the 1870s, there was a project to create a casts museum in Spain to make accessible make works of art of antiquity, the canonic works, to the wider public. This was a practice that, as you know, common at that time. We also have seen an, an example in the previous communication. The first steps to launch the project were first to decide who was to be in charge of this project, and the one chosen was Riaño, to take care of everything, let's say, from choosing the pieces, ordering the cast, managing the budget, everything, everything necessary to launch the museum. You can see in the image Riaño and also images of his successors as directors of the museum. Second decision to be taken were, and this were was the Cason del Buen Retiro uh, of Madrid. You can see also an image here on the slide. And then this when after these years of preparation, was 1881, was the year the museum was opened. Uh, just with 156 pieces. But the collection from then was growing and growing, and nowadays this collection has about 3,000 pieces. So really, uh, has grown a lot. The museum was located in the uh, Cason del Buen Retiro only until 1961. After that, uh, it was closed for a time, traveling from one place to another, and finally it reopened just a few years ago, 2012, as part of the uh, Museo Nacional de Cultura in Valladolid. We have been lucky enough uh, to find in the archives of the British Library in London a letter Juan Facundo Riaño sent to uh, Austin Henry Layard, February 17th, 1881, precisely the year the Museo de Reproducciones Artísticas was opened. The letter, the letter has four pages here. We show you the first and the last page of, of this letter, and I will read for you just some excerpts of the first and the second page. Uh, the interest of this letter is that the museum was not yet opened, so it helps us to see what was going on when they were still preparing this opening of the museum. As you know, Layard was a well-known British archaeologist and diplomat at that time, and Riaño and Layard were in touch for their whole life. Um, and it was interesting that the relationship was a um, counsel or an advice relationship in both ways, because Riaño was advisor of the South Kensington Museum, the current Victorian Albert Museum, and uh, Layard was also counselor of Riaño, um, for, for example, ordering some of the casts. So they were enriching the collections of both countries with, uh, with their correspondence and their, and their contacts. Let me begin then uh, just reading some of the excerpts of this letter. Let me read the, the excerpt you have here in the slide, and I quote, I hope the new change of government may not affect the interests of the museum. 
So much money has already been spent upon decorating it that they hardly will think of making use of the building for any other purpose. End of the quote. So here, what you see is that uh, in the, at the end of 19th century Spain, there was this alternance of uh, prime ministership between liberals and conservatives in really short periods of time. So it was really difficult, let's say, to launch a project and to finish this project with the same government. And it's what happened here. Uh, the image you, have, you see here in the slide is the image of Antonio Canovas del Castillo, who was the prime minister putting on the table the project of the Museo de Reproducciones Artísticas. And in this slide, you can see uh, an image of one of the catalogs of the museum with a dedication to him. But then, Canovas del Castillo was launching the project, but when the museum was opened, the uh, prime minister was uh, Praxedes Mateo Sagasta. Um, and he was in charge of, of this prime ministership from February 8th, uh, 1881. So just 10 days before Riaño wrote the letter we are discussing here. That's why he is mentioning this, well, there's a recent change of the government, let's say, uh, what happens, let's hope that everything is going to be uh, working as it was planned. Following the same excerpt, let me read the, uh, the red part, and I quote, unfortunately, it has not yet opened and the great thing the architect has done has been to send away almost all the workmen who were busy painting the pedestals, etc. Well, this part is really interesting because the museum opened 1881, as I told you, uh, but we do not have the exact date. If you have a look on the catalogs on the Avenue, the first catalog, they mentioned January 1881, and in recent publications about the museum, always is mentioned January 1881 as the official date of opening. But we know from this letter that it was not open because the letter is from February. What we can imagine maybe for this mention of these workmen still painting pedestals and everything is that maybe they were uh, making an official opening of the museum in January, uh, presenting the catalog and so on, and then not opening to the public maybe until March or April. And then the workmen, of course, uh, had to came back and paint what was remaining. Moving now, uh, sorry, what you have seen in this previous slide is the main room, uh, the main hall of this Casón del Buen Retiro that was the only one open from the very beginning. Then they were opening other rooms and finally was the, the whole building occupied. Continuing with the second page, moving now to the, to the second page. Um, it's interesting because here you have some clues about how, how these reproductions were, were ordered. Let me read this excerpt you have in the slide. And I quote, I am happy to say that I have nothing to do with the building itself, which saves me from many worries. So you see that the issue of the building was really a big issue. As soon as I see my way, and probably will be in the summer, I will write to Peace Conyamillo and order the reproductions you have marked. I am rather short of funds right now, and I am expecting daily some heavy bills uh, for casts ordered at Berlin and Athens, end of quote. Let me begin with this. Uh, who is this Peace Conyamillo? Because it's not uh, so well known. It's a bit, uh, a bit tricky to, to identify him. Most probably this was uh, Pasquale Scognamillo, and indeed a Pasquale Scognamillo was mentioned in a guide of a temporary exhibition of archaeological materials from the south of Italy, which was held at Caserta in 1879. In the presentation of the guide of this exhibition, you can see the cover in, in this slide, um, Giulio Minervini, one of the organizers of the exhibition, is mentioning and acknowledging this Pasquale Scognamillo as one of the antique sellers from Napoli, collaborating with some pieces uh, on loan for the exhibition. It seems, however, that Scognamillo was not only an antique seller, but he was also running a society making and selling reproductions of the paintings found at Pompeii and Ercolano. In the catalog of the Museo de Reproducciones Artísticas, published 1915, an updated version of the, of the previous one, there are 10 of these paintings that were ordered to Sociedad Escoñamillo or Sociedad Escoñamillo en Compañía, which witnessed this activity and witnessed the contact of Escoñamillo with Riaño also during all these years. Maybe then the letter refers to some of these paintings. But there is still another possibility. Maybe the letter referred not only or not at all to the paintings, but to sculptures. Because it also seems that Escoñamillo himself was a gifted sculptor, and uh, he, it seems that the Sociedad Escoñamillo as well was supplying not only paintings, but the sculptures. In 1915, in the catalog of the museum, uh, I just mentioned there are about 30 sculptures by Escoñamillo, those made of bronze, or Sociedad Escoñamillo, those made uh, of bronze or stone, uh, or just stone. The image you can see in this slide is one of these reproductions, precisely, by um, made of bronze. 
and is one of the images uh, chosen for the permanent exhibition in this new display of the museum reopened from 2012 and one of the ones also chosen as representative of the museum for the online catalog they are now uh, putting online. Finally, to close this first case study, let's come back to the last excerpt of the letter I read you to take care of the last sentence. I am expecting daily some heavy bills uh, for cast order at Berlin and Athens. Well, for the first collection of 156 objects on display, only the best of sculptures working on cast at that time were involved. And the cast came from London, Paris, Athens, Berlin, mainly, and then also Napoli for some of the materials, as we have seen. The prices for the bigger sculptures were, of course, high, and most probably a sculpture included in these heavy bills Rianya was expecting was the one you see in the slide, where you see, however, the original. In the first catalog of the Museo de Reproducciones Artísticas, published 1881, we find this Victoria de Paionios mentioned as such, and as you see in the excerpt of the museum catalog we show you here in the slide, we have even the price. Uh, mil reales, and we have to imagine that mil reales, of course, was a high price for one of these reproductions at that time. Let me move now to the second case study. It will be much, much, much shorter for time constraints, but I am, we think that it's, uh, it's good to have both together to see a, a bit what was going on. In this case, also, Riaño is uh, the common link, but in this case, is dealing with another museum or collection, the one of the Cabinet of Antiquities of the Real Academia de la Historia of Madrid. This collection was a consequence of the existence of the same institution, because since the, its creation in the 18th century, this Real Academia de la Historia was responsible for collecting coins, epigraphs, and other archaeological objects, especially from Spain, that would contribute to a better knowledge of the history of the country. Within its collection, significant pieces stand out, so the, so, such as these ones you can see here, this Corinthian helmet of the Ria de Huelva, and the Theodosius disc. But what is interesting for us here are these three pieces. The Cabinet of Antiquities also contains three Assyrian pieces from the Palace of Sennacherib uh, in Nineveh, two reliefs and a royal inscription. The three pieces were acquired at the end of the 1840s by Antonio López de Córdoba and donated to the Royal Academy of History in 1851. López de Córdoba was ambassador in, uh, of Spain in Constantinople and had the aim that Madrid, uh, despite, of course, the possibilities were not the same, the economic possibilities were not the same, had to um, need it, a collection of Mesopotamian antiquities like the ones in Paris and London. Of course, it was not the case because these are the only three pieces and some scattered pieces in the uh, Museo Arqueológico Nacional. So the first aim uh, was not completed, let's say. Also in this case, uh, we were lucky enough to find a letter also helping us to understand something else about what was going on. And it's a letter of February 17th, 1895, now preserved at the Bodleian Library in Oxford, where Juan Facundo Riaño addressed, in this case, Archibald Henry says, requesting him to transcribe and translate the cuneiform inscription donated by López de Córdoba to the Real Academia de la Historia. Says was professor of comparative Semitics and Assyriology at the University of Oxford and published important contributions on Sumerian and Akkadian uh, philology. Although he also worked in other areas such as archaeology, you know, other philologies, classical philology, biblical studies, theology. The fact that Riaño asked Seis to translate the inscription is explained by three main reasons. First, Seis' international prestige in the field of Assyriology. Second, the fact that Seis was an honorary member of the Real Academia de la Historia. And third, the uh, already mentioned links of Riaño with, uh, with England. In the letter, Riaño asked Seis to send a transcription and translation of the text. Although we have not been able to locate Seis' answer, it was positive, as Riaño himself reported in an article from the same year, from 1895. Says, who at that time was in Upper Egypt, quickly sent him the requested material. Using a drawing of the inscription that Riaño sent him, Says proposed a correct transliteration and correct translation of the text. And uh, it's interesting to notice that it was not until 1966 that Joaquin Peñuela, one of the pioneers of Assyriology in Spain, published a new edition of the same inscription of the Real Academia de la Historia, so only 70 years after that. Just to, uh, to sum up, to wrap a um, couple of issues for these final concluding remarks. First, we want to highlight that these two case studies uh, based on the correspondence of Juan Facundo Riaño are good examples of the influence of international academic networks, not only in the creation, but also in the study of collections and museums related to antiquity in Spain, in one way or another, at the end of the 19th century. Second, international networks shown through this correspondence were common at that time throughout Europe and have to be read positively as proof of contact and international work from Spanish scholars. 
However, um, in these particular case studies, we think they also suggest shortcomings. For instance, lack of specialists in some fields, such as archaeology, lack of certain collections in the Spanish museums, or scarcity of money. Shortcomings which have to be also taken into, into consideration to build a more complex picture. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>